Hello and welcome to episode 37 of the Rivercats 9 Lives podcast. Our guest this week is longtime San Francisco Giants third base coach and bench coach and absolute Giants legend, Ron Wotus. Welcome to the uh, Nine Lives pro- podcast brought to you by California Bank of Commerce. We have Ron Wotus with us, uh, Giants legend. And, and of course, I got to see you a lot last year being a special assistant. It was great to see you coming through uh, uh, with the AAA, coming to the River Cats, coming to Sutter Health Park. Did you enjoy that role? Welcome, by the way. And uh, how much did you enjoy that role? Well, Johnny, first of all, it's great to be with you. Um, I enjoyed it a lot. Um, I got more enjoyment. You know, out of going back to the minor leagues, going up the sack, I got to see you a lot, got to know you real well, and you do a fantastic job, by Thank the way. You. Appreciate that. It, everybody up there from yourself uh, to the front office and, you know, the coaches and everybody that runs that thing, I had a real good time. And, and the same thing when I went down to San Jose. You know, I hadn't been there since 1990 when I managed in San Jose. And working with eight ball players uh, was a real treat for me. I love to teach, and, you know, they're like sponges. There's so much that that they need to know about the game, so it was it was a lot of fun. Yes, absolutely. You know, well, you come back to the minor leagues after being in the big leagues for so long. What was that? Uh, what was that experience like? It was probably deja vu, but you you come back and you you see these young players come up. That must have given you a, a real kind of satisfied feeling with those minor leaguers, right? It does. You know, it brings you back to your roots. I mean, look, I I spent a long time in the minor leagues as as a player. You know parts of you know six seven years in triple a and been up and down and then of course uh managing you know i managed in san jose two years shreveport three and then phoenix our triple a club two and you know that's grassroots it's baseball there's no, no distractions it's all about the game you know you don't have a, a media event to do here you, you can't get on the field because there's some kind of program going on you know you get there early you hang out with the guys like i said and the coaches and uh, you go out and take the guys out on the field and try to get them better. You know, I know what, and that gives you the satisfaction. I know watching you go out for early work with these guys in AAA and then seeing the improvement, seeing them get, getting those guys ready to go to the next level and uh, contribute to the San Francisco Giants. How satisfying is that, seeing what the work you do, the early work on the field, that translating into uh, making changes at 7 o'clock? Well, you know, um, when, when it works and, and they grab something or they have success, it is as gratifying as anything in the game. You know, winning championships, uh, being part of the team, World Series or games, that's extremely gratifying because you're reaching your goal. But, you know, w- when I got into coaching, you know, that's where I started in the minor leagues. And uh, there's, there, there's nothing better and more satisfying to help a player improve and get better. And then, of course, you watch him go to the major leagues um and it's real gratifying so you know i think that's why we do it um you know it doesn't always work like that you know it, it, it can be a challenge with certain players some play, players um you know are all ears some are a little more difficult so there's a challenge there and and trying to get them to do certain things and you know sometimes um they're getting so much information uh from a lot of people you don't know what they're going to put into their game but i love it when they can take instruction put it into their game and you see the success and it helps them become a better player. Love that. Now, look, you, you, you played for, uh, or you coached in uh, the system with Felipe Lou coached in the big leagues with Felipe Lou with, 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 uh, with Bruce Bochy, of course, with Dusty Baker and, and Gabe Kapler, all four different type managers, but you got so much out of each one and they got a lot out of you. Can you kind of articulate a little bit about each, each four of those guys and, and, and kind of, uh, what it was like working with them. Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, uh, you, you look at the individuals and immediately think uh, that's four extremely different people, right? Dusty, Felipe, Boge, and now Cap. Um, but deep down, you know, th- they're all very similar. And, and you know, being a major league manager, how hard they work. Uh, I know Cap works extremely hard. He's working right now. He'll be working eight hours a day today, right? He's uh, mm-hmm. He never, he never stops working. Yeah. Um, but they all have that passion for the game. Um, of course, their personalities are different. They go about it a different way. Obviously, we're a little heavier in the analytical side today. Um, you know, when I was with, uh, with Dusty, you know, that wasn't even really a, a thought. But I will say this, you know, we were using analytics in our own way. 
um, we were looking at the numbers that we looked at and we were applying it probably different than they do today. So we, you know, and, and then Felipe, of course, uh, well, let me say this about Dusty. Dusty ran a clubhouse as good as anybody I've ever seen in my life. I mean, he can meet a president and he can meet, you know, a guy driving a beer truck and they're both going to walk away feeling really good about themselves. Felipe, he used to hold court after the games, and I really loved that because I learned a lot about the game and managing. He'd hold court in the coach's room after a game, drinking wine and just replaying the game and, 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 and holding court the way he does, explaining things. Of course, Boach, we had so much success together. You know, it was kind of a combination of the other two guys. And uh, when you're winning like that and doing what we did, um, there's really not a bad moment. And I already talked about cap a little bit now. Um, you know, the 107 win season was fantastic. You know, this has been a big winner for us signing guys. So it was a, it was a unique experience working for those four different individuals. Yeah, no question. Now, look, uh, I know you don't like talking about yourself, but the 2000th win, I know that meant a lot to you, you know, and, and it meant a lot to Giants fans. Can you take us through that day a little bit? I know, I know it's not in your comfort zone. You don't like talking about, it, but please, Share with us what that what that was like in that experience. Well, I was honored to even have it being uh, aware to certain people that it was the 2000 wins. You know, usually the coach doesn't get a whole lot of accolades for how many games he wins. It's the manager. So th that was very touching to uh, to be in that situation as a coach. And really, you know, when you when things happen like that, you you kind of reflect on your career a little bit. And, uh, you know, it's just been an honor to be with the Giants as, as long as I have. That longevity allowed me uh, to win 2,000 games along with all the great players and winning teams we had in San Francisco. So you kind of reflect. Uh, it's an emotional moment uh, internally because you're doing this reflection on how long you've been there how many great players and, and you've had to work with and managers and coaches. And uh, you, you just reflect, you know, so it was a great moment. Yeah. You know, look, you've been, uh, you've had managerial interviews and you, you've had uh, bench coach offers, you know, you, you've had a lot, but you, you really, uh, you know, the giants are in your blood, uh, you know, and, and I know that, it, you know, look, you've obviously, you're obviously worthy of getting a managerial job. Is that still on your mind? Do you still want to, uh, do you still want that? Is that still like something uh, you focus on or, or you just kind of, if it happens, it happens. Yeah. I think it's more, if it happens, it happens. Look, I, I've interviewed eight times and uh, we were winning world series and I was getting interviews, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, the game has kind of changed. It looks like they're going after uh, uh different, you know, individuals to manage. Uh, the experience is not at the top of the list like it was years ago when I started and in the middle of my, of my career. You know, if you had that experience as a bench coach and you were successful, um, that really meant something. But that that's not really at the top of the list anymore. So for me, it's it's something that I don't even think about. Mm -hmm. um, if if someone came calling, I would entertain the thought. But no, it's it's been a few years. Um, since I really wanted to do that and look, was looking to do that I, more than a few years, it's probably been seven or eight years that I just kind of said, you know what, I love my job. I love what I do. And, uh, I'm not going to worry about things out of my control. Yeah, exactly. No, well, look, the new rules coming up and, you know, we saw it in triple a with the, with the pitch clock and, and, uh, of course the, the shift we did not see in triple a, but the shift is, is coming, those two rules, what do, you, what do you think? How is it going to affect the Giants? What are, what are your thoughts? Well, I think the Correa signing improves us. You know, obviously, you know, the bat comes first with, with all players. Everybody's looking for offense. But it improves us defensively tremendously. Now you got Correa uh, out there. you got Crawford um, out there. Uh, you have Estrada. You know, not to mention Flores and, and La Stella. And, and all the other guys we have, but when you're talking about the defensive side of the game with no shift, um, this puts us at a, a much better place than we were last year to have three shortstops in the middle of the diamond. You right. know, a lot of the teams have that. You're going to need the range. So I, I think that's that's one key for us. Um, you know, defense has always been my passion and what I've been in charge of. Um, and so that's going to improve us 
quite a bit. And I, I think that's a huge upgrade for us. As far as the pitch clock goes, um, it, we'll, we'll see. You saw it, Johnny. We saw it in AAA, yeah. right? We saw it in action. I think everybody wants the game shorter, right? You do, I do, the players do, the okay. fans do, the, the, the ushers do, uh, television does. So um, I think there'll be an adjustment with – you know, how it's implemented, the mechanics of it. You saw it in Sacramento yourself uh, at the beginning of the year. It wasn't probably as smooth, but I think they'll catch on pretty quick. The The part of the, the new rules that I'm still not quite sure about is uh, the uh, throwovers limiting. Yeah, the I was just going to say that. Yeah. Yep. You know, yeah. I mean, it's changing the game an awful lot. And I just hope that analytically we don't try to manipulate the clock there's so many there's so many changes it's just not the base dealer now now you're going to be looking at that clock okay the you cannot throw over early because you, you might need a throw over but they're going to be looking at that clock as base dealers you right. know it's ticking down i saw a lot of pitchers in sacramento last year you know they didn't deliver the pitch to one second you know and the clock's almost done because it goes pretty quick by the time you get your sign yeah. you come set so they're going to be timing that. It's just going to change the base running. Obviously, the bases are closer. So there will be action. That's what they want to accomplish. Um, but I'm, I'm really interested to see how it changes the game at the major league level. It didn't change it all that much at the minor league level. I don't know if you would agree with that or not. Yeah, you know, in the ABS, the automatic balls and strikes, which is coming, they say, which is coming, which was very interesting. You know, I just reminded of, uh, you know, a. a a sinker that um, that jelly threw that was that, that was low and away, literally like a, a couple inches off the ground, and he and they called it a strike, and he was out there like he was laughing. He was like, "You got to be kidding me!" But that's and we looked, and it did. It actually it cut the edge of it a little. It was a strike actually. So that's going to be an adjustment too when that comes, right? Yeah, no doubt about it. I mean, the thing that I loved about it was you really couldn't tell that there wasn't um, the umpire wasn't making the call. You know yeah. that. that looked right you know the umpire is making a call except for the one day you saw it when um i can't remember the pitcher he threw a pitch right and he looked in at the umpire and he said was that was that pitch up yeah and and, and the umpire went like this i don't <laughs> he do it in, i don't know yeah not making the call it was, it was mcgee it was mcgee it was yeah. mcgee yeah was, where'd that pitch miss the umpire goes, i don't know right <laughs> yeah so that I had a belly laugh in the dugout like I haven't had in a long, long time. I mean, that's not the game I know. It's amazing. Hey, we have a uh, some fan questions here. One is uh, actually a broadcaster with the with the Albuquerque Isotopes at Josh uh, uh, Sushan. He says, "What is your favorite ballpark to walk the warning track?" I, I, I assume not not counting Oracle. But what's your favorite ballpark to walk the warning track for the game? Well. You know, I, I do I do do a lot of walking and there's several that I like. But, you know, when you're out here in California and you go to San Diego, you go to L.A. and you're going for a walk, that weather is is most of the time, especially San Diego. It's just perfect. Right. right? So so I really enjoy the weather there. Uh, it's great to get out there, stretch and, and walk in the ballpark. Of course, I, I love doing it in other parks on the east coast because that's where i'm from you know philly in new york just because you're back near your home yeah and and you're smelling the grass and it brings you back to your childhood but i would have to go with san diego okay uh the next one is at pax.rock favorite memory as a third base coach what is your favorite memory as a third base coach hard to narrow down oh, that's a real tough one. I, I know my least favorite moment. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> There's an answer in the question. I, I think, right. Johnny, you might know what it is. Yeah, I think it was the, the the check swing. No. Well, that's a good one. But I'm going to take it a little more personal. It was yeah. when uh, Mauricio Debon ran into me at third. Oh, okay. I never, never thought that would happen. Mm -hmm. I was waving him in, bringing him around hard, and I stopped him late. And I was way towards the third base line. So he came way out. Yeah. And I'm looking at the ball, my hand up, stopping him, pointing this way, stops up. I look back, and he's two feet in front of me. And by the time, I had no chance to Was get that out the first of time that's ever the first time that's ever happened? Oh, yeah. A absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So the worst moments stick with you. 
Yeah. Um, and, you know, next to that would be getting a guy thrown out in, in a crucial situation where the run may have cost you the game. You know, yeah. that happens to every third base coach once in a great while, hopefully not very often. You know, before we get into another last fan question, you know, talk about 10, 12, and 14. Uh, all three were different, right? All three championships were different. Uh, but I, I wanted to touch that before we let you go about those three titles. Because I, I think I'd be remiss to not mention them while, while we have you on here. Because I would have to get three and five years like that when you were the underdog. And I think really all three of them, really. I mean, you weren't really a favorite in any of them. Um, so reflect on that a little bit. Sure. Well, going back to 10, um, you know, like you said, we weren't a juggernaut and, uh, you know, we were able to get into the playoffs. And as you get into this thing, we knew our pitching was outstanding and, and we won the division series. But then we had to go to Philly, who had been in the World Series. I mean, they were the class of the league at the time with Utley and, and Howard and, and Rollins and all these great players. And um, yeah, holiday, they had holiday on the mound. They, they had a great pitching staff. And, uh, I remember the coaches talking, we said, you know what, if, if we can score a few runs, we, we have a chance. And if we get through Philly, um, we have a chance to win this whole thing because that's how good they were. And sure enough, our pitching, our, our pitching carried us. And it was, you know, I was more excited. I wasn't more excited than winning a world series, but when we beat Philly, I remember I grabbed Braggs and, 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 and hugged him that we got through Philly because it was, it was a nail biter to go to the world series. So great memory, great, great moment. Um, and then once you've done it once and then you go into 12, what, what, what's unique about that was, is we had all those uh, must win games. Mm -hmm. You know, we were down 0-2 to Cincy. Then we were down 3-1 to St. Louis. Um, and, and the thing that I loved, I, I mentioned this the other day at a banquet I was at when, when Boach got up and talked about Gideon against Cincinnati and when Hunter got up and gave his heartfelt speech, how he didn't want to go home. Um, that took so much pressure off us. We're down 0-2 and we played all these tight games and not one guy was nervous. There was just a, a, a calm confidence about this club and, and we won all those elimination games. And that's not easy to do because there's a lot of pressure in the playoffs to perform. So, so that really stands out to me, uh, being able to accomplish that. And, and it all started with those speeches. And then, of course, the last one, um, we've all been through it. We just tried to enjoy it. You know, we said, yeah. here we go again. We had that confidence that we're going to do this thing again. And, of course, without Madison Bumgarner, maybe it wouldn't yeah. have happened. Yeah, I just like the story about uh, you could hear a pin drop in Kansas City because people, oh. people that were there talk about that when he, when he came – Coming in from the bullpen, uh, it, you, you, people are, oh, no, here we go. It was it was silence, right? One of the greatest moments uh, on the field, you know, uh, in, in, whether winning or, or, or big games, is when he walked out of that bullpen. And it was a, a tight game, and there was a lot of game left. But yeah. you're right. The crowd went silent. I thought Jim Lynch, the uh, producer, of the giant games. I've seen it after when I got home and he showed the crowd and people were all happy. And then they went, they all just got well, rounds yeah. in the face, and he delivered. It was a great moment. Man. So, Hey, speaking of TV, how are you enjoying doing the TV? You do a great job on there. How are you enjoying that, that aspect of it? Oh, thank you. I, I appreciate that. Uh, I, I'm, I'm finding my way. Um, <clears throat> you know, I enjoyed it. It's something new and different. I love talking about baseball. It gives you an opportunity to talk about the game and break down the game. And, and I love to do that as well. I mean, being an ex bench coach for 19 years, that's kind of my thought process. Um, it's not as easy as it looks, as you know, Johnny, I mean, the job that you do and, 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 and doing this type of stuff, it's not that easy. So uh, we're working out the kinks. I enjoyed it. All right. Well, I enjoy hearing you with, uh, with Marty uh, all the time. I'm, I enjoy listening to you guys. Our last question is, um, oh, it's from Magic G Lock 24 at Magic G Lock 24 asks, who's the next River Cat to make an impact with the San Francisco Giants? Wow. That, that's, that's a good question. Um, well, you know, I, I think I think VR had already been up. Yeah. So and he, he he's the obvious he's the obvious choice. I'm thinking back to the end of the year. Um, I missed Schmidt at yeah. the end of the year. You saw him. Yeah. Um, 
uh, you know, I, I think he's got a real chance. And there was probably a couple of pitchers in there that came up late that I didn't see in the last few weeks. Um, and I, th- their names, I'm, I'm not sure who they are, but I don't want to discount some of the young pitching yeah. that we have coming. Uh, but probably I would have to lean if, if you are, you know, makes the club. You know, I, I think Schmidt is the next in line because this guy, this guy's a good, I mean, you saw him. He yeah. can pick it. I mean, he can fl- he can flat out pick it. I mean, he reminds people of Arenado, you know, the way he does it. And uh, I, I saw him in the spring. Boy, he's just a natural at it. And he put together a great offensive year. And uh, I know he used to pull off the ball and they say he's not doing it anymore. So I, I think this is the next guy to make a real impact. Yeah, well, you know, with Cole Waits and Dabovich, uh, possibly, and then uh, look, Kyle Harrison, they're saying uh, has a chance to start at with the with the River Cats and AAA. So there, there's some there's some talent coming. Yeah, I agree, Johnny. You just mentioned uh, Dabovich. I didn't see, but Cole Waits, I saw in AAA and I saw in the big leagues. Yeah, he, he's he's got a, a nice arm. He's got that good high fastball. Comes at you, great mentality. So yeah, those are, those are great names. I'm I'm sure we're going to see those guys throughout the season as well. All right. Well, well, hey, look forward to seeing you. I'll see you at spring spring training for sure. And uh, it, it's wonderful to to get uh, just see your face and, and get to hang out with you for a little bit. So appreciate you taking the time. You got it, Johnny. It was great being with you. You have a great holiday. Thank you for listening to the Rivercats Nine Lives podcast hosted by Johnny Dosco. Please like, subscribe and share with all your baseball loving friends. And make sure to follow us on Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, YouTube, and Facebook.